Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hello from First Lutheran in Detroit Lakes. Hello from Good Shepherd in Moorhead. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood squares. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I'm in San Francisco, actually. Too close to the Um, this, I don't know. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Bishop Bill Tesh. If you can hear me, just give a thumbs up. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining this call. Just a, a technical note, uh, it works best if you mute yourself uh, using the little uh, speaker or microphone icon uh, if you're not wanting to speak. Uh, and uh, But if you do want to speak, there'll be a time where we'll ask for questions. You can unmute, unmute yourself. We also have the chat feature and Christina uh, johnson Dernier will walk you through that. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, with a brief devotion and then setting uh, just some purpose and guiding principles at this particular moment in our life together. And then uh, I'll turn it over to Christina to guide us through the meeting. Uh, so I'd like to share from Psalm 121. It's one of my favorite Psalms. The Psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life safe. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. I've been thinking about this psalm quite a bit lately. Uh, the psalmist begins by with the words, I lift my eyes to the hills. And of course, in this particular era of God's people, the hills were that place of safety, that place that people looked to for protection, where they would flee when, when the enemy or when trouble was coming, or even when there was a plague or a famine. But in this case, the psalmist looks to the hills in that normal place of security and comfort and doesn't see any there. And then is reminded that ultimately, the psalmist's help and our help is not in any of those locations that we often look to, those um, structures that we look to for security, but ultimately only in God. We're living through a particular moment where a lot of those uh, systems, institutions, services that we have relied upon for security, for comfort, for our well being are being stressed to the point of failure. And like the psalmist, uh, when we look to those, we and, and we find that they maybe can't be as much help to us as we once hoped. Um, we are reminded that our our trust is in God, and that our our help and our hope is in the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. And that doesn't mean that we will be without trouble, but it means that we have God's mighty hand leading us and holding us through this time. 
and inspiring our imaginations to be creative as we seek ways to serve our people, to reach out with the gospel in new ways, and as we seek ways to love our neighbor. Let us pray. Eternal God, amid all the turmoil and changes of the world, your love is steadfast and your strength never fails. In this time of danger and trouble, be to us a sure guardian and rock of defense. Guide the leaders of our nation, our communities, our institutions, our healthcare systems and first responders, our pastors and deacons and SAMs and congregational leaders with your wisdom. Comfort those in distress. Grant us courage and hope to face the future. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So I want to begin by laying out just a, a sense of um, kind of setting the stage for our purpose and uh, some guiding principles that I think are helpful to keep in mind in this particular moment. And then I'll, uh, we'll also be hearing um, from Dr. Bill Taylor, who will, uh, is a physician that will provide us with a medical update. Uh, we'll uh, also uh, review the, who will also review with us the recommendations coming out of our Minnesota Department of Health. Um, we'll hear from uh, some of our pastors, Hans Dahl, and some, uh, and some of our uh, worship and music staff uh, around best practices for use of online worship and other remote uh, worship opportunities. Uh, we'll also hear from Pastor Frank Johnson and, and Chris, uh, Chris Dernier, our communications director, will chime in as well at, at these times. Uh, but we'll hear from uh, around practices around caring for our neighbor at this particular time. Uh, Pastor Brad Scogan will share some ideas around self-care for rostered ministers and for leaders. Um, and then we'll be happy to uh, entertain your questions. Um, this meeting will last for one hour. So as I think about our vision as a, as a synod, our vision to be communities set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can be wholly devoted to loving Jesus and loving our neighbor, I think now more than ever, we need to hear that, that word that sets us free. And so it's about finding creative ways to do that in this moment, right? Which we'll be talking about. But also um, now more than ever, our community, our neighbor is in, needs us. Both the neighbors that are near and the ones that aren't so near. The ones who we serve every day and the ones who God is calling us to serve in a new way in this new time. I really believe that we were the, the church was made for such a time as this. That's been true throughout history, and I think it's true today as well. Um, we have these core, one of our core principles is making a safe space for the ministry of the gospel to unfold. And of course, that's probably been our major focus as we, of, of our thinking and it will be of our activities in the days I've had, I had. How do we make a safe space for ministry to unfold, whether that's in our spaces or dispersed as a, as a dispersed community, as a diaspora um, in our various places around the synod? And finally, I think our two values of authenticity and love are guiding here. Authenticity is about welcoming the authentic gifts of all people. In this new moment, it's going to take some creative thinking and some, some new, I believe, new energies and new people will emerge uh, who bring a passion for being able to serve because of the unique gifts that they have that are suited for this time. Um, I believe we have an opportunity here uh, to become more adept as a church in this 21st century, reaching people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ through the tools that are, that are out there and that are available to us. And of course, love, which is about uh, going beyond good intentions and acting in such a way that it actually is beneficial and actually helps our neighbor. That can be hard to do as we figure out what's best. And that's part of what we're about here today, figuring out how can we love and serve our neighbor. And so um, I'm going to introduce Chris Johnson Dernier, who is our new uh, communications director. She also serves as our uh, youth, uh, youth resource person and our events coordinator. But of late, she's been pretty focused on being the communications director. Uh, so uh, Chris, I'd like to turn it over to you. By the way, um, 
Chris sends out emails uh, almost daily uh, or some kind of a social media, Facebook or Twitter updates. I invite you to pay attention to those. Uh, when she's, uh, when I want to communicate with you, I will be doing it through Chris's, uh, through Chris, and she will be sending uh, messages from me uh, on her email account. So you will want to make sure to add her to your contacts and list her email as a safe email so that it doesn't get diverted into your spam folder. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hello everyone. It's nice to see you all. Um, I want to just do a gentle reminder on your bottom left hand of your screen, you should have a little microphone. And even if you're like are very quiet, please turn the mute on unless you're talking because there'll be some background noise um, no matter what. And we are recording this for people who aren't able to be with us um, live today. So we want them to be able to hear us without like the scratches and um, you know, some the random dog bark if you're home and all of that. Um, there actually should be on your bottom left hand um, of your screen, there should be a raise hand um, icon. I am, uh, since mm -hmm. I'm an administrator, I don't have that as an option, um, but there should be. And so later on when we get to the questions, you can either um, type a message, a chat to me, or raise your hand. And also the people who are um, joining us via their phones, there is a mute option there as well. Um, so please, please mute if you're not talking to kind of help make this go well. Um, yeah, that's kind of that. I, again, what Bishop Bill said, my email address is Chris Dernier, K-R-I-S-D-E-R-N-I-E-R -E -E at cord.edu. You should have gotten some emails from me. Um, I know some of them might have been um, come hit spam folders and whatnot. So please make sure that you um, put my email address in, um, in your safe folder. I do um, tend all of our social media for the Senate. And so I have been vetting resources, um, actually looking at them and watching them and making sure that they're from ELCA sources or partners or um, just good helpful resources. Um, so look there um, if you need things and I'll keep updating those things. So like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's enough for right now and we'll um, have Dr. Bill share. Dr. Taylor, thank you for being willing to uh, offer your wisdom to us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you now. All right. Well, just an update on sources for information. I would say pick one or two trusted sources because there's so much fake information out there and misleading information. I had the opportunity to review a Facebook post this morning by a pastor in Florida that told his congregation they're going to continue shaking hands and mm -hmm. hugging because that's just the way they operate and they're not pansies. Well, that's, that's going to be contrary to the goal that we have set in uh, corralling this virus and isolation and distancing are two of the major processes that are going to limit the spread. That as well as attention to hygiene, making sure you and your families know that this isn't a hoax, it's not some engineered virus from China, it's not a product of the U.S. or any other military. It's not the right wing or the left wing. It's a real disease. And it's very similar to the ones we've seen before, the SARS virus and the MERS virus with an animal vector intervening. intervening. But this is a new one that the human host hasn't seen. And it's carried probably by a bat to an open market in Wuhan, China. That's where it's all started, and we don't have any current active medical treatment that would kill this virus once it's inside the host. For topical 
measures on non-porous surfaces. The usual disinfectants that you use in your household, Lysol, a diluted bleach solution, etc., would probably be sufficient. And they have a list of the approved chemicals on the CDC site. The only drug treatment for this is an experimental drug called Remdesivir by Gilead Pharmaceuticals, and they're only reserving the trial of that drug in the most extreme cases. So prevention is going to be the primary way that we handle this. And if we are able to prevent it, get people to cooperate, I think we'll see an end to it shortly. It's not ended yet, and it's going to get a lot worse. People think that 46,000 deaths per year from the flu is a lot. Well, this virus has the potential for causing seven times that uncontrolled. So it's very important that we comply with the measures the CDC recommends. Right now, they're recommending limiting mass gatherings to 50 people or less, avoiding non-essential gatherings for sure, and even for medical visits, call before going to your doctor's office. You don't want to be exposed to this virus because you thought you had it. The symptoms are generally fever, uh, sore throat, dry cough, lassitude, fatigue. It primarily affects the lower airways, and that's why it's so deadly. The flu, you get runny eyes, rhinorrhea, nasal dripping, a cough, but with this virus, it goes deeper into the airway passages and causes an intense pneumonia where the lungs are normally soft and spongy and are able to exchange oxygen. This makes them stiff and rigid like rubber with the pneumonia. And again, no treatment other than prevention. Should, who should be tested? If you have symptoms, you should be tested. And I mentioned what the system, symptoms are. Who should be wearing a mask? The people that are extremely debilitated and have chronic illnesses, and people who have symptoms, and people who have positive tests. Someone in the general population who has no symptoms does not need to be tested. I think that's the primary message I wanted to bring to you today. So if you have any questions, I can answer those later. If I could just uh, chime in here, this is, uh, I'll un start my video. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I think, um, so um, as Dr. Taylor said, uh, CDC is now recommending no mass gatherings of more than 50 people. And even in that case, we should still maintain physical distances of six feet or more. Uh, and then I, I believe that when we also take into account uh, the guidance around at-risk populations, which would be 60 plus people who are 60 or older, uh, limiting those gatherings to 10 people, I think that pretty much means all of our congregations will be unable to hold worship in a public setting because um, most of our congregations that worship less than 50 have a majority of members who are over 60. And so um, you're, you may be in a different context. You have to use your judgment. Um, but I just would say, along with Foot Stomp with Dr. Taylor, um, it's, a real, it's a real threat, especially to your elderly and uh, people with underlying health conditions. So um, right now, my recommendation is to suspend worship until further notice. Um, and uh, what we want to do now is offer some guidelines for how we can serve our people with the gospel and love our neighbor. Um, Chris, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yes, um, there are um, a lot of ways that we will talk with Frank um, about ideas that you can um share 
the um, um, care for your neighbors with um, with Frank Johnson, Pastor Frank. Um, do we have um, Bishop Bill? Do we have more from Commissioner Malcolm to speak on on the agenda? Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So um, I just uh, I think I think I addressed some of the the recommendations from Commissioner Malcolm, um, which which coincide with the CDC's recommendation. Um, so, you know, uh, there's, uh, we have, there are resources for, uh, communities that can gather. Um, if you can gather, uh, if you, if you, if you're at, you know, you're not exceeding that critical mass of 10 people in the at-risk population, um, or that the, the group, you know, the majority of your audience are not in that at-risk population and you're under 50, um, please see the, CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health websites. Uh, the other piece, which I think is fairly onerous for us, is that we um, is the sanitation of surfaces. Uh, as Dr. Taylor stated, this virus can live for a, a, for a, um, up to uh, 48 hours on certain kinds of surfaces, like stainless steel uh, or steel flat surfaces which are if you think about it that's our door handles into our sanctuary which are touched by everybody that walks into the sanctuary so you have to be able to sanitize all of those surfaces on a fairly regular basis and you need to be able to pull off a worship service without relying upon people who are in the high risk category that also puts most of our congregations out of uh, out of any ability to uh, to hold worship so um Chris, I'm going to turn over to you to uh, uh, for what's uh, for talking with um, resources for the majority of our communities which cannot meet during this time. Yeah, our synod office has gotten some phone calls from churches and other synods too, looking for resources. So this is something that's new territory and kind of scary for a lot of people. Um, it's always good to practice, but we have some people on the call that do this on a regular basis. So they're gonna share some of their um, wealth of learning and resources with us. And then I will just kind of add at some of the resources that I have found lately too. So is Pastor Hans Dahl on? Can you share with us? Yeah, I, hi everybody. Um, it's an honor to be with you all uh, today. These are anxious and scary times for a lot of our people. And so I, uh, and for us, if we're really honest as leaders of the church, so I uh, commend all of you, uh, proud of you for all the hard work you're going to do over the next coming weeks. Um, here at Calvary, we've been uh, just really basic as far as live streaming. We've been doing that for a long time and, and many of your churches are doing the same. Um, we use some really simple tools. Um, we use iPads and a little app called Switcher. And it allows you to do uh, some pretty good quality live streaming. And it's really, really simple. It's really simple. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out. So uh, actually, I think my son could figure it out. So it's really simple. Uh, one of the things we did this last week is we actually pre-recorded our service. And one of the things I want to suggest is that's a good practice to do. Um, I think it can sometimes feel a little awkward. It can feel strange to us who are leading worship when no one is in the room. And so for you to pre-record something and then uh, even to use, if you've got uh, a Mac, you can use a simple program like iMovie to, to edit those kinds of things. A um, Couple other things, we, we are getting our team together tomorrow to make some long-term plans. Um, I'm going to look to my left because I have my marker board up here. Um, but a few things we're going to use, there are a lot of free resources out there um, in terms of different areas of ministry. So we are going to live stream um, every morning at 10 o'clock uh, a little, we're going to call it Calvary Kids Live. And uh, we're going to have, have a little video that we uh, put live out on Facebook and encourage our families to check in. And, uh, you know, I worry about our parents who are going to be home and stressed out and trying to care for kids and trying to 
uh, lead in ministry or lead uh, at work at the same time. And so uh, we're going to do that each morning at 10 in the morning. And then each night we're going to do what we call the, we're going to call the daily dose. And we're going to provide a little devotional experience along with some worship music each night. And we're just going to put that out there on Facebook as a tool for people uh, to get connected. A um, couple other things we're doing. One of the things that we're really proud of here at Calvary is we have a lot of small groups from elementary age all the way through our grandmas and grandpas. And so our staff is going to dedicate uh, their time to getting uh, to, to caring for those small group leaders. And so we're going to check in with those small group leaders every week. And what we're going to ask them to do uh, uh, after we've taken care of them is to challenge them to be in connection with their small groups. I think it's critically important that we, we connect with our people uh, via the phone or via technology. Uh, it's more critical than ever, ever before. And so we're doing that. Um, on Wednesday nights, at the time we normally have what we call Elevate, uh, you might call it Confirmation. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a program that we put out live on Facebook as well. Uh, there, again, there are all kinds of free canned resources out there that you can use for this. And then encourage families to huddle up together and uh, have some discussion around that. Uh, the last area of ministry, maybe I'll throw out and then, um, you know, maybe turn it back to you, is, is around serving our community. And uh, if you haven't been in touch with people in your community, uh, such as the sheriff's office and the hospital or the clinic, the school district, the emergency manager, public health, I just want to encourage you to do that and to just say, how can we be for you and for our community during this time? Um, we went to a meeting on Friday here in Alexandria of community leaders, and uh, the school district is going to ask us to help out with some, some ministry along the way. Uh, United Way in town has asked us to pack bags of food, which we will do uh, in small uh, doses for families in our community. Uh, as Bill said, I think this is prime time for us as the church to be a presence in people's lives. I think generally as a church, we ask, uh, we ask things from people, and now it's time for us to bring that ministry to people, to be for our community. So uh, I guess those are a few of the ways that we are going to continue to be present in people's lives. Um, uh, we're really trying to retool how we think of who we are as a church. Um, so much of who we are as a church is around the expectation that people will come to us. And I wonder if we're returning to what the church was meant to be by being a church that goes to people. And, and so we have to retool from thinking of being a physical church to being more of a virtual church. And so that'll be a lot of our work over the, the coming weeks ahead. Of course, the big thing that we're all afraid of is offerings. And so just want to encourage you to be gracious in asking people for your offerings. And if you don't have automated giving, uh, you got to do that yesterday. And there are all kinds of tools for that. Um, Bill, if you would want, I'd be willing to put together a document with all kinds of resources that we use that I'd be willing to share with you that you could share with um, with folks, if that would be at all helpful. Thank you, Hans. That would be great. If um, I know we have a, a, we're accumulating resources on the page that Chris has created, and uh, that would be a nice supplement to that. So, yep. Don't you think, Chris? Yes, a couple. I'm going to share my screen with you all. Um, and so, a couple. Here's our Synod's Facebook page. Um, and on here, I have some resources. This is Rob James, who works at Churchwide, kind of giving a lesson on Zoom. Zoom is free for people um, um, for meetings 40 minutes and less. Um, and a lot of um, places have um, given temporary licensing for streaming because we, in this time, don't want to get sued. So I've posted on our Facebook page 
um, lots of resources. One license, Agrofortress has done all of that. A couple of online resources, Banco is one site that the Synod used to use for online giving and it's, it's pretty easy. They have a start and sustain, um, Banco and I'll, there's, I'll put links to this. And then the Synod office just put, started a relationship with Tithely. Um, and for church giving, it is zero, it's free for just using their giving platform. Um, they take a percentage on cards, um, but that's a pretty standard thing. They have a lot of other resources as well um, for you to check out if you ever had a down, a down moment. Um, but all I needed to set up Tidely from our, for our Senate office was our EIN number and then the account number and the routing number. So it was very simple. Um, in this time, speaking for myself, if I can get up to the top of my thing. Um, I have been shopping on Amazon a little bit more than um, normal, even though I do kind of shop at Amazon a little too much maybe. Um, but Amazon Smile is an easy way um, to give money to an organization that you care about while you're shopping. Um, and so I encourage you to check out Amazon Smile. Again, all I needed to set up the Synod, I'm supporting the Northwestern Minnesota Synod right now. Um, all I needed was the EIN number and the routing number and account number for our checking account. Um, and that's just a really easy way. If you don't wanna have an Amazon Smile, it could be a way for you to lift up one of your partners in ministry that does work in your community or that your Synod cares about. Um, so those are just some online resources that are um, that are easy to use because kind of like Han said, one of my friends said, well, if you can figure it out, most people can. Um, and so um, I was able to figure out Tidely and Amazon Smile. And so you can too, or if you don't, just email me and we, and I can help you walk, walk through it with you. Um, so those are some online resources and I'll post, post some other things online for you guys as well. Um, so caring for your neighbor, Hans talked about that. Um, is Pastor Frank still on? I'm here. All right. Can you share a little bit, Pastor Frank? Yep, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my experience here thus far in our community of Halak and how uh, last week I, I started walking around and chatting with uh, some of our leadership uh, local community county and uh, city leadership about um, where they were at with things. And one of the things I discovered is that um, there are, were segments of the uh, community that really hadn't processed what any of this means yet. And I mean, that was as of last week, but even today, we finally had an emergency management meeting that included social services for the first time today. And it's, you know, it feels like things are moving so fast for some people. So it, it, it doesn't hurt just to reach out to those people as, as uh, Pastor Dahl said as well, um, just reach out to them because they, I mean, they're on uncharted charted territory as much as we are. So a couple of things I realized in talking with uh, um, social services, emergency management, the hospital, uh, or the county, the city, all of that business, we sat down. Um, I realized, first of all, that I was actually really useful at that table. Um, I, you might not think like, well, pastors and whatever, but, but actually like there were a variety of areas where they really hadn't given any thought yet. Um, one of them was implementing physical needs within our community for things like food pantries um, and for uh, ministerial associations for when people start asking for financial help. Who, is the, who are the people to direct them to when social services gets overwhelmed or who can't fit or when people don't meet the correct definitions for help from the county or the state? Um, there's going to be this whole limbo time. Congress is doing all these things. We don't really know what's going to come of it. We can be a wonderful intermediary in the, in the meantime if we talk with our local clergy groups and whoever else is in, involved in that and we can actually begin to plan what are we going to do when people start asking us for money? I mean, because there's going to be real needs as people, uh, some people might be losing their jobs, some jobs might be changing dramatically. Um, it's, it's hard to know. So that's one thing. Um, 
uh, talking with people about who is uh, who is in charge of emergency financial needs in your com community, um, talking with social services, um, or having one of the pastors in your area at least talk with social services. Um, and then also um, making community leaders aware of the mental health side effects um, that might be coming from isolation. And I think that's one of the things we're just beginning to think about as every, every one of us is like, holy cow, I like people. Um, and so here we are uh, being feeling like suddenly we might be overwhelmed and uh, on our own. Um, so one thing that I realized sitting down with these leaders is that they are as overwhelmed as we are right now because they're, they're sifting through these enormous amounts of policies and procedures that somebody wrote in a time when they did not imagine this was actually going to happen. And now they're trying to figure out how to make that work in the real world. And uh, they don't know. And they haven't thought about mental health because they're busy dealing with all the practical stuff, the lower Maslow's hierarchy of needs things. And we're way, we're up here in the clergy realm of trying to figure out how to deal with the whole picture. And some of us, we maybe need to step back from that. But, um, and then, uh, so uh, looking for, uh, what, so when it comes to mental health side of it, uh, the one thing that I found that I was helpful for is reminding these local leadership, people in local leadership positions, sheriffs, uh, sheriff's department, hospital, uh, the uh, um, uh, city, county leadership, and there's probably other services in your area to, um, to let people know clear, accurate information face to face. So the more that they can be in front of a camera saying things, the way that Bishop Tesh did last week before any of this really blew up about our response to COVID-19, um, the more they can be saying clear things, the less uh, ill at ease people are going to be. Because right now there's so much misinformation. There's so many th things that need to be corrected from people. And I mean, even just sitting in on calls like these helps me at least. And I'm imagining it helps some of you to like get a sense, A, that we're in this together, but B, that, um, that, that there's people who, who, are, who are dealing with this, who are, who are addressing it, and people who are doing everything they can. And so the more you can let those people know, in addition to your own um, moving to digital in a lot of ways, as I'm seeing most churches doing, also encouraging your local people to, who are on the front lines of this to also do that. Now, they're overwhelmed with a bunch of things, but they have people. There are people who are willing to help and who can give clear information. And um, yeah, so I would encourage that. And the other thing uh, is, I, I mean, it, it might be worth planning for the long haul right now. Um, it, we, we have this kind of moving end zone right now where it's like one week, two weeks, three weeks. Well, I can tell you, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to like be a, be anything other than a realist on this. Our emergency planning meeting was for four months. So if you, if you aren't thinking, I mean, I, it's worth thinking about because if you're going to keep moving the end zone, it, the, the anxiety is just going to raise and raise and raise. So it's, you not that you need to say that, but like there's, there's people planning that far out. So um, all of those, those things, the four, four things were phys addressing physical needs, making community leaders aware of the mental health side effects, um, seeing familiar faces and presenting clear information and planning for the long haul. That's what I've uh, figured out in 24 hours. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. And thank you also, Pastor Hans. It's great stuff. I just want to um, underscore a few items. Um, those relations, it's so critical that you make those connections with community leaders that both Frank and, and, and Hans talked about. Those, those will be that people will welcome your engagement at this moment in times past when they may not have. Uh, uh, I'm guessing usually they would, but it can be the case that they would, wouldn't see the need, but now they will welcome your engagement with them. And, and that's going to pay huge dividends, not only through this time, but also in the future for the future of your ministry. So um, I would encourage you to make those c connections with leadership, um, mental health, uh, public health, first responders, uh, and uh, school district, uh, all of those uh, health system leadership in your community. Um, so I if, if there's kind of an under, uh, un, there's, a, there's an overarching theme here, which is, you know, spiritual connections while maintaining physical distance. And so it's time to move past thinking about, gee, I wonder if we ought to try something online or do online giving and actually do it, whether you choose uh, the app that uh, Pastor Hans suggested, the Switcher app or, 
or Facebook Live or Zoom or some other platform. Just pick one and run with it. And uh, the same is true of your online giving. Uh, put, a, put a donation button on your Facebook page. Include a link in every email you send out. Um, remember that we have folks that don't connect that way and the mail st still works. You can still put a stamp on an envelope and send it in the mail, as long as you're not personally feeling sick when you send that. Um, and send that, to, you know, get, you can send cards and notes to people, text messaging, checking on the vulnerable. So maintaining those spiritual connections while, while, um, while practicing physical distance. Then I would invite you to consider what our what I think our uh, presiding bishop so beautifully stated in her video, which is to think about this time not as a as a um, as a suspension or as a uh, sacrifice, but as a Sabbath, um, a Sabbath from from gathering, a Sabbath from the busyness of our lives and even a, a, a Sabbath from some of the things that we highly value, but a way for us to engage once again in that basic faith practice of Sabbath keeping. I think we can see that uh, in this time. And then of course, we've, as Chris has shared and others, learning how to use the wealth of communication resources that are out there. Uh, this, we're gonna come out of this stronger as a church. It'll do some, it'll hurt for a while, uh, but we will be stronger because we will be so much more adept and able to, to be the church of the 21st century. So uh, thank you for that input. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Christina, for whatever's next. Yeah, um, thank you for people who are using the chat um, feature and putting things on there. Um, I'll make note of those and share resources as well. One thing that I have found to be very important is sharing um, kind of like Dr. Um, Taylor said earlier is making sure you share the, the best information possible and that um, can be found um, on I've spent more time on the CDC website than I ever thought I would in my life. Um, but there's just really good knowledge. Um, so right now, and this changes often, um, kind of like Frank was saying, the moving end zone, but um, for the next eight weeks to cancel or postpone in-person events for 50 people. Um, I've been on the phone with some of our friends at the Minnesota Department of Health um, asking some various questions. Um, but again, really good resource and the information on there is going to be the most accurate for our people um, since that changes up a lot as well. Um, so that's just one thing I wanted to share. Um, this has been kind of a hard, stressful time um, for, I have a lot of friends that work in churches um, that I've been in touch with um, and trying to see them face to face um, through physical distancing. There's a, a professor at California Lutheran that I um, appreciated. She didn't like the term social distancing because we need each other at this time, but physical distancing is what's gonna um, help keep us safe um, and keep the especially vulnerable people safe. Um, but one thing that's going to be very important for us is to take care of ourselves too during this time. I jokingly told some friends that I've been watching season three of The Crown because um, my life is not as hard as Queen Elizabeth's life. Um, so that's just one thing of self-care. But um, Pastor Brad, are you still on? Can you share some um, self-care resources for us? I'm here. Thanks, Christina. Um, right now, uh, thank you all for, for accepting the call to ministry and for doing uh, this work in this way. Uh, when we do that, when you've done that, um, what goes along with that uh, is a different set of stressors uh, and a different exposure to all kinds of uh, tension and activity and information and uncertainty. And at that time also, an increasing sense of responsibility. Um, uh, we have long periods of time 
of uh, exposure to many stresses. And you know, for example, uh, some, a person may share uh, something with one of us, uh, and they're sharing that uh, that sadness, that grief, that tension, um, and and we become uh, sort of collectors of all of that for all of fo all of these folks. Uh, and along with that, have this expectation of, of knowing what we're doing uh, and having some answers um, and an expectation of, of being gentle and strong at the same time. Uh, and as we're doing all of that in our, in our calling, uh, also having a disruption of our own personal lives and trying to meet uh, our own needs uh, and needs of family uh, and that uh, that can become a perfect storm for, um, uh, for our own um, uh, our own stress and, and burnout and compassion fitigue and all of that to manifest itself. Um, I, I wanted to share a couple of things uh, that I think are really important uh, about how to live with that and to, and to continue uh, doing what we're doing and, and being authentic and loving uh, in ministry. One of the first things I want to share with you is um, that this is, I, I like to use the idea of hydration. Um, when I talk about resilience and, and uh, feeling exhausted and fatigued, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if it's occurring to you that you're feeling a little thirsty, um, that's your body saying you're already dehydrated. You know, uh, we hydrate all along throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, and if I go, hmm, I wonder if I'm a little thirsty, if I'm getting that sensation, it, we're already there. Um, I think that things uh, like exhaustion and fatigue and burnout um, if you're, if that occurs to you, if you ask that question, or I wonder if that, that's what I'm experiencing, I'd encourage you to take the question mark off the end of the sentence and, and make it a statement. Uh, because if you're wondering, that's a good clue that you might, you might be experiencing a bit of that and, and need to uh, take some steps uh, and, um, and pause or return to some uh, daily uh, disciplines and exercise uh, in a variety of ways. And really what's going on with all of this uh, that, that I experience and you may experience is we're, we lose control. We lose a sense of grounding um, and centeredness. There's so much uncertainty. Uh, and if, if there's a way to mitigate that or respond to that by restoring a bit of agency or influence or control, that, that can start to counteract uh, that, that sense of, of burnout or compassion fatigue. Um, and, and we do that um, in, in some ways uh, that, that can be small, uh, but important throughout your day. Uh, if you have a, a devotional practice during the day, uh, ensuring that you take time to do that, um, ensuring that you're uh, having enough to eat, you're actually pausing to take a meal um, or um, or going for a walk or getting some physical exercise, having some of that routine disappear uh, exacerbates things, makes it worse. And being able to return to routine or even create some new routine to structure uh, a break, uh, a scripture reading, prayer, meditation, um, I think that, that that's a really crucial uh, thing to do. Um, if, if you've flown on a plane ever in your life, you remember the flight attendant using the oxygen mask and, and telling you, don't uh, put your own on first. Don't try and do that for someone else before you do it uh, for yourself because you'll, uh, you won't be able to help them. I, I like to encourage you to think of uh, your, your care of, of, of yourself and one another in that way as well. Um, be sure to meet your basic needs. Um, and in one of the concerns I have about the term self-care is it gives the impression that we have to do it for ourselves. Um, and, and really, I encourage you to have a buddy system, and engage with colleagues, uh, engage with others who can help cue you to the need to pause or have a meal or, uh, or whatever uh, that is that you need. Um, having a, a buddy system or if you don't feel, if you feel isolated right now, trying to identify or uh, ask someone to become that uh, with you, uh, I think is also important uh, to have it's not all up to me or you for ourselves uh, to, to be connected in relationship. Um, that's another piece that I want to emphasize is relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, 
you and I have basic fundamental needs uh, every day uh, that also need to be met if, if we're uh, faithfully and, and effectively going to be uh, able to uh, minister uh, with others. One of the things that um, I heard uh, Bishop Bill uh, open up with are, are these, these two things of authenticity and love. And in relationship, um, I think as, as you're thinking about resilience and, and being able to continue along through this, um, I think part of authenticity is being able to, to be vulnerable. And as a, a resilient strategy, perhaps uh, identifying uh, someone or, or a couple of folks with whom you can be uh, appropriately vulnerable, um, where uh, so you're not on an island and, and experience authenticity uh, of yourself and another in that way um, to, um, to experience love and grace as, as you're trying to share that with others. Um, I'm going to pause there uh, and um, I'll wait for questions in a little while, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Christina. Thank you. Um, yes, taking care of yourself um, is very important. Um, so thank you so much, Pastor Brad, for sharing, sharing that. A couple of resources, again, that I want to lift up um, that I have like post-it notes everywhere. So I like see one in the corner and then um, remember it. Um, Banco is doing a webinar tomorrow at noon. Um, so if you don't have online giving and would like to learn more about Banco, um, I will post a link to sign up and register for that free webinar tomorrow at noon. Um, and also um, Taking Faith Home is a resource um, that's become available to our Synod um, for you guys to share with um, your families. Um, and also I saw a couple other resources um, for families to do like a faith five um, for those sorts of things. And so again, I'll be posting on Facebook um, and I've started a page on our website and all of those resources have been vetted. Um, so you don't have to worry about them being um, not theologically in line with us as the ELCA or like it's not even worth your time to read because you guys have plenty to do. And um, with me being in this position, um, that's kind of my, my job to do. Um, one other thing that's been lifted up that I want to make sure that I do is if your congregation um, has done live streaming or does online um, things well, please email me um, like how you do it and your email. And I'd like to compile a list for people who would like to learn more. Um, so um, if you have that, please email me, the Chris Dernier at core.edu um, to share those valuable resources. Um, with people who are just learning. And one important thing is to um, make sure that you explain to people how to use the resources if it is a new resource. Um, so yeah, so please, please consider doing that as well. Um, those are kind of the resources that I have right now. Um, I keep looking at them online, so please keep checking our, um, our social media. I've upgraded our Northern Lights and that will be an important thing to check out. It's different every every week so please open up your Northern Lights and look at the resources that are in there as well. Those will come Wednesdays at about one in the afternoon um, so be looking for that as well. Um, before we open up for questions is there anything Bishop Bill you would like to say? Thanks, Chris. Uh, and thank you too, Brad. Uh, I just want to say just to uh, foot stomp and to circle back with some things that Brad said, you are precious right now. Always, of course, precious in God's eyes and precious, but especially at this moment, your community of faith and your community where you're called to serve, you are, you are a precious gift. And so 
do what you need to do to, to care for yourself and to seek out the care that you need. Don't hesitate to reach out to us as a Synod staff. Um, you know who your staff folks are nearby. You can con contact me, I'm easy to reach. Uh, but but uh, return if return is what it is for you or continue if that is the case. Those spiritual practices that sustain you and feed you and those mental health uh, uh, disciplines that are useful for you because you are precious and I just want to say I'm really grateful for you and your leadership uh, that I believe God has called you to just such a time as this. Uh, one area where you could be also helpful, uh, we know, we, we are learning that our uh, database is in need of continual upgrading and that it's not always as timely as we'd like it to be. Um, we, uh, and we're, we're working to improve that. But in the meantime, we're, we are aware that uh, we, we have some, it can be difficult for us to communicate with congregations that do not have a rostered minister or that have a brand new rostered minister, at least in a mass email. So if, if there's someone near you, uh, a congregation nearby that doesn't have a rostered minister that isn't getting emails or perhaps a synodically authorized minister, um, or maybe there's a brand new rostered leader in your midst, uh, if you could channel information to them, that would be useful. Ultimately, probably the easiest way to get access to information without having to have some system work um, or some database function properly would be through social media and Facebook. And Chris will be maintaining that and updating that on a regular basis. So we do have just a, a couple of minutes and we could entertain some questions or comments. Um, Chris is, uh, will monitor the chat and if there's a question that you want to ask in the chat area, um, go ahead and do so. Um, one question that came up is how long is a recommendation for no worship? So Bishop Bill, what, what can you say to that? The current CDC guidelines are saying uh, are for, for gatherings of less than 50 and for uh, fewer than 10 with people in the at-risk population are for eight weeks. Another it could change. Question. Yeah. It could Another change. Question that's come up um, is what about like funerals and weddings um, and that? I, I've seen some good resources come through that we can post on our website. Uh, confirmation class, I would think in the same way that you do about worship. Um, you have there a, a, a digital digital natives who can manage that quite easily. Um, so re, uh, doing that remotely should be possible. Same way with Holy Holy Week. Funerals are a unique challenge. Uh, there, you know, I would say that if it's possible to hold a funeral and maintain uh, uh, physical distancing and and good uh, hygiene practices, then that's great. Um, I don't know, has anybody had a funeral recently where they've had to manage and work through some issues? I just talked with the funeral director this morning uh, because I have a funeral that's supposed to be coming up and the family is open to um, just having a private goodbye with their loved ones. Uh, I don't even need to be present and then to have a public a burial later on when it's okay to have a burial uh, because uh, we're not able, not able to have a burial now anyway. So um, that's the latest here in in the War Road area, Rose Old War Road. Uh, this is Hans in Alexandria again. Uh, we had a funeral today um, and it was a large one and it was very mm. uncomfortable for everybody. Yeah. And so tonight our council is meeting and we'll make policy to, to not hold other than private funerals for just immediate family. And uh, we'll use the same policy. Once we're past this, then we can gather for a, a more public celebration. Um, but at this time, it, it, see, we're just putting people at risk unnecessarily. And, and we have to heed the warnings. We as a church need to lead the way and say, could we get away with it? Probably, but is it the right thing for our community and for our neighbors? And the answer is just no. We have to discontinue gathering people and be a part of the, the solution. 
So right. I'll get off my book. Yeah, I, I, I just canceled a funeral for this Friday because there's no way to really socially distance very effectively at a funeral, you know, and it's just, um, so we're not having any funerals until this is over. I think that's wise guidance. I would just say, and also, um, and this may sound counter to what we've been saying. I, I, I want you to hear, we're taking this really seriously. You need to take it seriously. I would also add, I think it's important for us to demonstrate uh, calm and rationality. And by that, I mean that our practice should be to pay attention to what public health sources are telling us in terms of what the guidelines are and that we would not exceed out of our own sort of intuition, exceed those guidelines, um, because then that would, that, that demonstrates fear, uh, more of a sense of fear and panic. Well, the CDC is mm -hmm. telling me to do this, but I'm going to go even further and, and, you know, whatever, you know, if you might imagine going further would be, um, what we want to do is demonstrate informed and calm, rational, behavior based on the science and on CDC's guidance. And I think that will go a long way towards um, preventing panic. So as that applies to funerals, probably private funerals going forward, it sounds like. Less, there you can get in groups of less than 50, but I hear you when you say awfully hard to do a funeral and also have social physical distancing. So um, I think it's wise to uh, to look at more towards private family funerals. This is Al Brooks in Twin Valley. Just this morning, I was talking to our local funeral director, and 10 a.m. this morning, they were ha they I don't know how big a group this is, but they were having their own conference call, so they may have their own guidance coming forward across our whole region. Because I'm I'm guessing whoever's in this conference call probably represents your community as well, so they'll have some guidance to give us too. I just got a text message from our funeral director following up on that meeting and they're sounds like they're just going with what the CDC is recommending. Um, two more questions that I want to make sure get lifted up before we end our time. Um, Bishop Bill and I were chatting about communion a little bit earlier today and Bishop Bill can you kind of share um, how you and Bishop Eaton um, put some thoughts on communion. Yeah, I want to discourage the practice of, of holding communion remotely and inviting people to participate with whatever resources they have there at home. Um, I think it's difficult to, 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 to teach a confirmation class around um, what we believe about the real presence of Christ in, in, in the midst of the sacrament and, and, and conduct communion in that way. Willing to have a conversation with folks if you feel strongly differently, but this is in the Conference of Bishops, this is the guidance that's being recommended, which is that we see this time as, as, a, as a kind of a Sabbath from Holy Communion. Um, and there may be exceptions in ministry with the dying uh, and other unique circumstances, but for large gatherings that we see this as a Sabbath. Um, I would invite us to consider our uh, our heritage in this part of the world where, where uh, people went oftentimes for six months without having communion, waiting for a, a circuit rider preacher to arrive. And while um, that, of course, produced some unhelpful ideas around Holy Communion, it also produced a great deal of longing and respect and desire for the sacrament, which I believe we can come out of this uh, time of Sabbath with, with that type of, uh, of thirst and hunger uh, for Holy Communion. I just have a question. question? Go uh, ahead. Oh, this was regarding to what you just said about communion. I, I was thinking about offering that to families that wanted to come in as a family or as a couple or as a single from their unit that I could offer them communion in that small arrangement, but maybe that's not even advisable. 
I don't see any problem with that. If so you're practicing good hygiene and uh, good good distancing. Right. They, they could call the office options. and say, we'd like to come in as a family and have communion, that I could do that. But yeah, if you think that would be within the range of... Um, I, I think you it's know, being very careful. Seems, and and you can do that and still follow the guidelines, I believe. Okay. Okay. Thanks. If you have other resources or questions, please email me. If you are looking for a resource um, and need one, email me. And I've spent a lot of time digging in resources, so you don't have to. Um, so please email me and ask me. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I um, as soon as I'm able. Um, and yeah, for now to honor all of our time because everyone is so busy, I want to invite um, Bishop Bill for some closing comments and closing prayer. Mostly, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, the people in our congregations and communities uh, for your good work. Let us pray. Lord, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending. By paths as yet untrodden, through perils as yet unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, everyone.